How many of you have heard of John Wooden? You know who John Wooden is? How many people have heard of John Wooden? John Wooden was an All-American from Purdue. Played three years at Purdue. My son-in-law is happy about that because he's from that area. He was an All-American. He went on to become, went joined the Navy when they had a need for him to enlist in the Navy. And he became a coach. He coached Indiana State for a couple years. Then he moved on to coach in UCLA. And that's what he's most famous for. In UCLA, he has, has the distinction of coaching and winning seven national titles in a row. National basketball titles for the, for the collegiate ranks seven years in a row. And in fact, he won 10 altogether, 10 out of 12 times that they were even in the semi, in the semifinal. And the other two years, they were in the final four, got knocked out of that particular one. So he's coached some really great players like Lou Will Cinder, or known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and some other really good players. He's coached Bill Walton and others. But the big thing I'd like to share with you today is not about basketball. John Wooden was married for 53 years. His wife's name was Nell. John Wooden loved his wife so much that when she died at age 73, he was 74. He was at her bedside. Every month for 25 years, because he lived to be 99 before he died, every month he wrote a love letter to his wife and he put it under her pillow. Every month for 25 years. Talk about dedication and talk about love. I'm going to share with you what Rick Johnson started out in his uh, article that he has on what husbands need. He says, beloved and re revered by his players, legendary coach of the UCLA Bruins college basketball team, John Wooden, changed the lives of every young man who played for him through the powerful values and life lessons that he taught them. You can go online and look up John Wooden quotes, and you can get a whole raft of quotes that John Wooden had. I'm going to give you a couple more at the end. Just quotes about life, because he said his team, he wanted them to be more than just a team. He wanted to learn about basketball. He wanted them to learn how to live life. And a lot of them are really wonderful principles. You can go on and get them if you like to. But here's what uh, Mr. Johnson goes on to say, Rick Johnson, who wrote this book that I'll quote from a little bit. In a, in a few moments. He says, but of perhaps more importance, Coach Wooden was married for 53 years to the love of his life, Nell. Wooden was so dedicated to her that after her death in 1985, he continued to write Nell a love letter for every month for the next 25 years. He faithfully placed those letters under her pillow on, on, the side of her, on her side of the bed until he passed away in 2010 going to be with his beloved wife. Of course, that's what you believe in, a, in heaven and hell. Uh, this is an immortal soul, which we don't. Uh, this is the kind of man I want to learn about relationships from. Coach Wooden had this to say about marriage. Love means many things. It means giving. It means sharing. It means forgiving. It means understanding. It means patience. It means learning. And you must always consider the other side, the other person. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Young couples get married and don't realize it's different from, it's, it's different from courtship. You have to work at your marriage, and it's two-sided, and you'd better realize that. And here's what he says afterwards. I think Coach Wooden was trying to say, that we need to, be, to eagerly fulfill the needs of our spouse if we want to have a successful marriage. That's what Rick Johnson says from his book entitled What Husbands Need. You can find it on todayschristianwoman.com. So those are some quotes. Well, let me share with you just briefly because I looked up on, online just to see if they had anything. There's one that has 52 things that a husband needs. I didn't worry about that one. They had a lot of others. There's quite a few of them on what husbands need. So I didn't go. But I did, I did pick out two. 
One is by Rick Johnson. He says, what husbands need? And he goes on to say they need companionship and forgiveness. They need encouragement to fulfill their dreams. They need respect and they need time, time to themselves sometimes and time to be themselves. And finally, they need to be needed. So those are, those are what he brings out in his article on What Husbands Need by Rick, Rick Johnson. It's found in the same place, todayschristianwoman.com. Another one by Aaron Anderson writes about what men want out of marriage. And this is found in modernmarried.com, modernmarried.com. He says men want to be wanted, not necessarily needed. They don't, they don't just want you, I need you now. They, they want you to be wanted, not necessarily needed. Of course, they like to be needed too. They want to be taken care of. That's what he says. They want to be taken care of because many boys are taken care of by their moms and they get married. Like, however, you're not marrying your mom, guys. You're marrying, you'll be marrying your, your wife, you know, not, not your mom. But they like to be taken care of. And they say they like a wife to be in tune with him. That means to cooperate, to be in tune. He says they need to be taken out, men like to be taken out on dates. So they like the woman maybe to be an initiator from time to time. And they like to feel safe in a relationship that they can absolutely trust. So those are four from Rick Johnson and five from Aaron Anderson. But what I would like to do today is give a sermon on Nine biblical reasons why husbands need their wives. Nine biblical reasons why husbands need their wives. And this is about a tribute to the wives. This is, and I figured there'd be maybe more women here than men with a lot of them going up to the, to the men's uh, weekend. So I wanted to tailor it for that, but there are men too, and men can listen in on it as well. All nine of them begin with the letter C. All nine of them begin with the letter C, and all nine of them have biblical basis. Number one, number one, why a husband needs his wife. He needs her to compliment, that's an E, C-O-M-P-L-E-M-E-N-T, and they also need her to compliment, I-M-E-N-T. They need her to help complete him and they need her for someone they can compliment. Now, hopefully, both will go back and forth. Hopefully, she'll compliment him, too. But she comp she's a compliment to him. She helps fill him out. And in fact, many will say a good marriages happen not just because people love each other, although that's requisite, but because they complete each other. That, that the, the man sees something in the woman that he doesn't have, that she completes him. They complement as opposed to compliment, but I have both. So let's look at a scripture, uh, Genesis 2.18. What did God say? Genesis 2.18. I'll only give you a couple scriptures on each one, so it'll be about 18 scriptures because I have nine points, nine reasons. Genesis 2.18, he says this, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone before he made Eve. Comes back and tells us how he made the male and female. He made the man first and he made the woman after. He said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. The word help, you can look it up. It's lots, used lots of times. And it has to do with an aiding, aiding somebody, helping somebody. God is our help. So God helps us. So a woman helps, she aids, she assists, she's there with him. And also the word meet can also be translated mate, can also be translated around or before or against. In other words, they're there with that person, a helper with that person, a helper suitable or comparable to. She wasn't made less than the man, but she was made to be his helper. She was made to complement him, to add what he lacked. And I believe in every woman there's a lot great adaptability in the women more than in the men. That women can adapt. If the man needs them to fill in this way, they do. 
If they need her to be the social butterfly of the family, they do. If they need her to be the one who organizes, they do. If they need her to be the one who keep, keeps things in line and, and helps things going, keeps things going smoothly, they do. It's up to them to fit in together, to work together. It's not about the man being a boss and the woman just being a slave. It's not master-slave relationship, although some say that can work in the psychological field, master-slave where the man and the woman just bows and scrapes to him all the time. Not a good relationship. But again, to complement, complete, and to complement, give expressions of respect and admiration. And isn't it interesting in Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 33, some will say even that husbands need respect almost as much as they need love. They need to hear affirmations of respect almost as much as they need to hear that you love them. They need to know that you respect them as a wife. So they need that from you. Ephesians 5, verse 33, he says, let, Nevertheless, let everyone in you in particular so love his wife, and we'll come to love later on, even as himself. And the wife, see that she respects, or deeply respects, reverence, it says in Old King James, New King James more respects her husband. That is so important. It's so important to be able to give compliments it's important for the man to give compliments too. He needs to have his wife. She's the crown, right? As a Proverbs 12, 4, she's a crown of him. You can also read in Song of Solomon, which I decided not to go to. But chapter 4, let me share with you just a few points. Chap chapter 4, this man, the husband, uh, expressing to his love, he talks about her eyes being like dove eyes talks about her hair being like a flock of goats. I don't know if I said to you today, came in and said, your hair really looks nice. You look, your hair looks just like a flock of goats. And you go, like, what? This, I'll take it all running all over the place. I go, okay, what's it? But that was apparently a compliment back then. Uh, her teeth look like shorn sheep. <clears throat> if I said to you as you smile, you have beautiful teeth. They look just like sheep that have just been sheared. What? Okay. Anyway, that's another one. That's but that's apparently was a compliment. Lips like scarlet thread. Lips like scarlet thread, and a temple. Your temples look like pomegranates. I don't know if you had bulging temples or if you're just talking about the color. And then finally, there was one more that I, I left out, that other one that's a little too suggestive. But anyway, he says, uh, her neck is like the Tower of David. Somebody said to you, you have a beautiful neck. It looks like the Tower of David. You're thinking, that's a big, massive neck this lady has, like a football neck. You know, you can't get, get knocked backwards. So again, to compliment and compliment. Let me read to you a couple of quotes that I have on this particular issue. Yes, here's, an, here's one. Man said, Prominent layman said, I'm sure my wife is an angel. So he was giving her a compliment. She's always up in the air. She's usually harping on something. And she ne never has anything to wear. <laughs> and then here's another one. Let's see that I have on that one. Uh, yeah, is that quote one? Uh, OK. Yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, yeah, here it is, up here, 1A. It's from, from uh, this one's from, these are all from quotations from 7,700 quotations by Paul, Lee Paul Tan. Uh, this is number 2345 if you want to check me out. Bowling Green, Kentucky, two octogenarians who renewed a youthful romance 68 years later can't agree on what to name their first child. Arthur Fortner, 88, and Letha McReynolds, 82, in 1974 renewed a courtship that broke off 68 years ago because he wanted to see the world first. 68 years, he must have microscopically seen it. But anyway, they were married September 3rd. Fort Fortner says the only dispute they've ever had is over what to name their first child. I don't think it'll be too much of a dispute at 88 and 82 right, to have their first child. 
So anyway, that's, that was another one. But he gave her a compliment. He came back to her, and they never had any fights at all. Let's go to the second point. The second point is why a husband needs a wife, is to conduct, to conduct, by conduct, but conduct. And that means the art of leading. If you're a conductor, there's an art of leading. Mr. Shoemaker's here, he knows that, how to lead the song. Mr. Warner knows there's an art to leading. There's a certain way. And it's to lead people. So he needs someone to lead. And again, Ephesians 5, verses 22 to 24, we find this. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. We will always teach that man's the head of the home. But how he's the head of the home makes all the difference in the world. The Bible says he's the head. When the chips are done, when it's final decision to be made, it's up to him. But he always wants to do it in conjunction with his wife because marriage is always about two. Marriage is not about one. You don't marry yourself. It's about two. And so you always take that into account. We'll talk about that later. We talk about communication. But he has her to conduct and it says, for the wife, wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. It's a husband who's looking after her too. And in verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject to, the Christ, to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So he needs a wife to conduct. How's he going to be a husband without a wife to lead and to conduct? I put it this way. He's the pilot, and she's the co-pilot. Co-pilots, capable of flying the aircraft, they may not have quite as much experience, but they're very capable. That's why they're a co-pilot. And in marriage, the husband's the pilot, and she's the co-pilot. It's not like he's the pilot, and she's a flight attendant serving the coffee. She's a co-pilot. She's with him, but he does need a wife in order to conduct. It's how he leads that is very important. First Corinthians 11 and verse three, just another scripture to buttress this point. First Corinthians 11 and verse three, we read this, but I would have you know, this is Paul, the apostle Paul, after he talked to Jesus Christ, who could have changed anything he wanted, he could have said, you know, that's a bad idea. It's an Old Testament view. Man is the head of the home. Let's get rid of that one and let's, let's update this. He didn't do that. But in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, he said, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. The head of the woman is the man. So God has given man that responsibility. And without his wife, how can he be a conductor? How can he be a conductor? So he needs his, his wife to conduct the art of leading. Who's he going to be leading? The act of leading. But remember, it's always, how does that husband lead? Third point, third C, why husbands need a wife, to communicate with. To communicate with, and I chose the word communicate rather than consult or something else because I wanted it to convey there's more than just consulting. There's conversing, there's talking to one another, there's sharing with one another information. Communicate is very important. It needs the means to seek the advice of and to seek the opinion of someone else. And husbands are very wise to make sure they seek the opinion, especially when it's about the family, especially when it's about both of them. Not to say, well, I think I'll paint this room green because I like green. Maybe his wife doesn't like green. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm the head of the home. I just paint it green because I like to. Why didn't he say, hey, dear, what do you think about this? Now, if it's his office and he's going to be in there most of the time, he can get her opinion. If he still likes something better than what her opinion is, he can overrule her. If that's what he chooses, it's his. Just like she wants the kitchen a certain color, she's in there more often than he is. She should be preference of what she wants. But again, it's working together. It's communicating with, it's seeking the opinion of. 1 Peter 3, 7 tells us that they are heirs together, heirs together of eternal life. 
How much more so should they be do, doing communicating one with another? 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife. I'll come back to that one. As to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life. They need to be sharing things, talking to each other, talking to each other about their hopes and dreams, talking to each other about their problems, talking to each other about their frustrations, talking to each other about their highlights, their happiness, their joys, their accomplishments, their successes. Talking, sharing, communicating. Husbands need a wife to communicate with. Try doing it with your dog. Dogs are very understanding. Try doing it with your bird. They may repeat a few things back. In fact, one bird heard the, wo the woman calling for the man. It was a parrot. So she must have picked up what this woman did. And so <laughs> now what some people were watching this bird for these people who are moving into their area. And they, this bird would say, Frank, Frank, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and every so often go, Frank, Frank, Frank. You know, I'm going to yell almost. I guess that's what she does to her husband. But you know what? He's, you're going to say, well, why is Frank late? He's not going to be able to help you. If you talk to your dog, they'll just look up at you with puppy dog eyes, and they'll love you, and they'll, they'll wag their tails when you talk nicely to them. And, but they can't give you input. They can't give their opinion. You know, they might wag their tails if they like what you're going to give them, or if you say nice dog, they might wag their tails. But they can't communicate with you, not on a way, in a par that helps you. Husbands need their wives for communications. It's interesting, I find in 2 Kings 4, verses 8 to 11, you might write it in your notes, I'm not going to turn there. 2 Kings 4, verses 8 to 11, you'll find the Shunammite woman who was so happy that, the, that Elisha kept coming by her place. And when she would come by, he said, she said, this is a holy man. She said, come on and eat here. Come on in, turn in and have a bite to eat. So he came a few times and then she said to her husband, they consulted, she said to her husband, you know, this holy man keeps coming by. Why don't we build a little room on here so he has a place to stay when he comes by? So Elisha was able to stay with them when he came by because they communicated. She didn't just say, you know, should we build this? No, they consulted one with another and were able to do that. How awesome is that to be able to communicate? You had a bad example of communication. Remember Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts chapter five? Oh yes, they communicated, they conspired. They wanted to let on that they sold this property and gave all the money to the church. When in fact, they kept back part of it and they were both party to it. They conspired together. Yes, they consulted, but they consulted for evil. A good wife will consult with her husband, but a good wife will obey God rather than man. And if that man says, well, let's tell them that, uh, let's tell them that we're giving them all, and we'll put the rest of it in the bank. You know what she should say? Honey, that's a lie. That's a lie. I will not be party to that. I cannot do that. And not just humbly follow him, no matter what. You know, God expects you to have first allegiance to him. And in any communication, you should be willing to openly communicate that to your husband, ladies, and not say, well, he's in head of the home, he'll be responsible. Yeah, he will be, but you'll be responsible if you were party to it. You're aiding and abetting. Let me read you a couple of quotes. I have, uh, here's a number three quote. And a 3A, yes, I have two of them. Here's a sign in about consulting your wife. Here's a, there was a sign in a wallpaper and paint store. Here's what it said, quote, husbands choosing colors must have a note from their wives. <laughs> Here's another one. They're only, I read their only dispute already, so here's another one. What an average housewife does, this is part of the praise that I missed, what an average housewife does, 
and this was back when women stayed home, okay? She cooks 35,000 meals in her lifetime. She makes 10 to 40,000 beds, depending on how large the family is. She vacuums a rug one mile long and one-tenth of a mile wide. She cleans 7,000 plumbing fixtures. So we better be grateful and thankful that we have our wives and we better communicate nicely and lovingly to them because they are there to help us through. So communicating, commenting on each other, talking to each other, kind words, straight words, straight talk, helpful talk, consulting before decisions are made. So that's point number three, communicate with. He needs, number four is he needs to have a wife to have a, as a companion. He needs to have a wife as a companion. A companion is translated an associate, one who accompanies another. She's there, she's his partner, she's there with him to accompany. Malachi 2 verse 14 is the scriptural reference for this one. Malachi 2 verse 14. This is said amidst a sad situation where men were fooling around on their wives and God called them on it. But he reminds them as why are they doing this? Malachi 2, Malachi chapter 2 and verse 14. He says, yet you say, you know, why? Why is this? Because the Lord has been witness. Why are my prayers not being answered? Why am I not getting any results? And God says, because you've been dealing treacherously with your wife. And he says, why? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth. I didn't put this in there, but it's always nice to remember how it was when you first loved your wife and how you would do anything for her, men, and wives, how you would do anything for your husband to be. He says, I've been witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, yet... She is your companion. She's your companion and the wife of your covenant. We'll talk about covenant briefly toward the end. She's your companion. She's one who's alongside of you. She's one who accompanies you. She's one who's with you. We need wives to be with us. Husbands need their wives to have as a companion. They are one team. Notice what Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 to 6. When he was asked about marriage and divorce, Matthew chapter 19, they asked him about divorce. It's okay to put your wife away for any reason, but notice what he says in verse 4. He said to them, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Don't you know he made them both? You want both perspectives? You want somebody there with you as a friend? He says, not good for the man to be alone. And he said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and, be cl and cleave to his wife. We'll talk about cleaving later, so I'm going to leave that for a moment. And they too shall be one flesh. Not only one flesh sexually, not only one flesh in the children they bear, but one flesh in, as a team, that they work together, that they are together as a husband and wife. He says, wherefore, what... They are no more two, but one flesh, and what therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. She's your companion. Why does a husband need a wife? He needs somebody alongside of him. And I know many of us in the early years of the ministry, our wife was our assistant. She was our, she was our counselor. She was our aide. She was our helper. She was our cook. She was everything to us as we traveled. And I said, you know, we we been out there in those early years. We better love our wives because we spend almost 24 hours a day with them. We're not going off to work somewhere eight or nine or 10 hours of, and coming back. We better love them a lot because you're with them 24 hours a day. Because you're at the ministry, you're traveling, you're together, traveling all over. And we still like being together. My wife and I like traveling together. We like being together. We like coming home together. We like sitting together. We like sports together. We like lots of things together. She's my companion. And husbands need a wife because they need a companion on the female side. Number five, why does a husband need a wife? He needs a wife to co-parent with. He can't have a child by himself. Eve was called in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20, the mother of all living. 
Every human being except Adam and Eve came from a woman. Every human being, male or female, unless they were begotten in a test tube, they come from a man and a woman. And Eve was, again, from a woman who bears them. Every person has been born except for Adam and Eve. Adam was made directly by God, and Eve was made by God out of man. The first woman was made out of the rib of a man. Everything, every other man and woman come from a woman as a, and a man generating. So the, both of them have part in co-parenting, but the woman's the one who, has, who bears the child. Congratulations to those who have children. Congratulations to those who just had children. That's awesome. Wonderful. Glad to build a church that way. So uh, they'll be adding to our numbers as they come along, the Boises and, and uh, the McGee's. Proverbs 1, verses 8 and 9. It takes both parents to bring up children. Proverbs 1, verses 8 and 9. Both parents have a part in it. Both parents need to lay down the law. Both parents need to teach. Not just a man, both of them. Proverbs 1, verses 8 and 9. My son, hear the instruction of your father. doesn't stop there. And forsake not the law of your mother. Mothers lay down the laws too. Why does the husband need a wife? Because he's not there all the time. Why does the husband need a wife? Because she can help add the tenderness. She can also add the strength in rearing the children. She's around. And in fact, more women have a say, sway over their children than the men do. Why? Well, because they're the caregivers. They're the, one, they're the ones at home. They're the ones that that baby learns. That's where they get their milk from. The baby learns that, that the comfort of a mother's arms. And many times, babies don't even go to the parents, dads initially because they're so tied to the mother. Separation anxiety comes in. But anyway, verse 9 says, For they shall be ornaments of grace to your head, and, and chains, not chains, not <laughs> heavy chains, but necklaces about your neck. But the husband and the wife both have a role in co-parenting. Husbands need wives to co-parent. Verses 23 and 24, uh, sorry, chapter 23, verses 24 and 25, Proverbs. Chapter 23, verses 24 and 25. The father of the, of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. When he teaches his child the right way, and that child turns out right, and he that begets a wise child shall have joy of him. So the wife will have joy as well. The father and your father and your mother shall be glad, and she that bore you shall rejoice. Husbands and wives, co-parent. And children need both. Children need both to step up to the plate and be with their children, to care about their children, to love their children. And it shows. Let me read you one other quote from John, John Wooden. He said, the most important thing in the world is family and love. Another one he said, the best thing a father can do for his children is to love, his, love their mother. If children see a loving father and a mother working together for their best interests, those children are going to grow up healthy. Those children are grow up, going to grow up with balance and a perspective in life. So again, co-parenting. The wife gives birth to them, but the husband has responsibility, and the wife too, in rearing them. Ephesians 6 verses 1 to 4 talks about rearing their children. Ephesians 6 verses 1 to 4, we're doing fine, time-wise. Ephesians 6 verses 1 to 4. Notice what Paul, again, the apostle Paul could have been told anything by Jesus Christ, right? He was taught after all the other apostles. He had kind of the final word. He was taught directly by him. And yet he didn't say, no, don't worry about that. Don't worry about this. But Ephesians 6 verse 1, he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Parents, not just dad. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. It's up to parents to be honorable. It's up to parents to honor their children too. 
to show them respect and honor by how they treat them, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. You know, dads can razz and pick on their kids. One fellow, I had the, not pleasure, but I had the opportunity to counsel with the son. You know what the dad did? He picked on the son to the son would try to fight him, and then his dad would knock him out. It gave his dad great pleasure to beat up his son. His son told me, because he came to college. Hey, what should I do? I'm going home. I said, here's what you do. You tell your dad, if you start to get into any type of controversy that's escalating, just say, Dad, I'm going to leave the room and go to my room, because this is getting too heated. I'm going to step out. And here's what you tell him. Tell him that Mr. Antion told me to do this. And if he lays a hand on you again, I want to know. You don't have to stand there and take that. You can just get out of the room. You can say, Dad, this is getting too heated. I'm going to step out of the room and go back, go to my room. If he follows you, you tell him, Mr. Antion told me to do this. So again, parents, don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture a discipline and admonition of the Lord. Bring them up. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he shall go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. Children will remember. I was just told today about a couple of older children who are thinking about coming back to church. They had church when they were young. They left. And the mother was so excited to tell me that one sister, one daughter said, I'm coming back. And by the way, my brother said, he's coming back too because of her good example of putting God first and walking in God's ways. And she taught them that sometimes when they get older, they will come back, they will return. You know, the name Eve means life giver or living. The word Eve means life giver. Point number six out of nine, another C is Husbands need their wives to consider, to consider their wives. Let me read this quote to you. On the dedication page, come from 7,700 quotations by Lee Tan. He said, on the dedication page of a witty book are these words. This book is dedicated to my wife, without whose help in proofreading, dot, 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 it would have come out earlier. <laughs> so he needs his wife to consider. He did consider her. He dedicated the book to her. He considered her as a good proofreader, so that's why it didn't come out so early. But it, to consider means to be thoughtful of and to think about. To be thoughtful of and to think about. So a husband needs a wife so he can think about somebody. So he can care. In fact, you know, in, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 7, Paul talks about, you know, these, those that are married, they, they also be thinking about their wives as well as God. But those that are unmarried, they can think solely upon the Lord, you know, because they don't have a wife or a husband to consider. We also find in 1 Peter 3, verse 7, which we read, but let's go back there real quickly. Husbands are to consider their wives. Notice he says, you husbands dwell with them according to knowledge. What is your knowledge about your wife? What is the knowledge of a husband about his wife? God tells the husband to think about her. Why? To have knowledge of her. Likewise, you husbands dwell with them according to knowledge. And notice, giving honor to the wife. And he's thinking about her as to the weaker vessel, not as a weakling, but as a weaker vessel. The wine glass as opposed to the beer mug. The man's the beer mug. The woman's the wine glass. They both hold libation. They both hold drinks, beverages. But if you clink them together, which one gets broken quickly? The wine glass, of course. Does that mean the wine glass is not good? I bet wine glasses cost more than beer steins, unless you get real fancy ones they have up in Maters in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, these German ones that are so big and decorative and hand-painted. Yeah, but just normally, you could buy a beer mug probably cheaper than you buy a really fine wine glass. So 
husbands need to think about their wives. They need to think, you know, my wife is like a wine, fine wine glass. I need to be kind to her. I need to be nice to her. I need to help her. She's got a sore back. I need to do the vacuuming this week. Uh, she's got a sore back. I'm not going to, and she's going through a dangerous area of town. I need to protect her. I don't want to go all the way, have her go into this dangerous area of town to, to wash the clothes since we don't have a washing machine. She has to go to a laundromat. I'll go with her. That's considering. Husbands need wives to consider, to consider them, to be thoughtful about and to think of. Ephesians 5, verses 26 and 27. Ephesians 5, verses 26 and 27. He says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word to help his wife, to encourage her. It doesn't mean to take God's word and preach to her. Some of the early ambassador students, I didn't know this and I didn't do this. I could have, but I didn't. But they, this one senior guy decided to take this freshman girl out for a walk and tell her all the faults that he had noticed in her in the last several months. I don't know why, for Bible study, why we're, this is correction day. So, I'm, you know, and I said, if I were the woman, I would have told him, you have no business telling me this. You're not my husband. But what husband wants to sit his wife down? Okay, dear, I've been noticing all these things wrong with you, and I, here's the biblical person. I'm the head of the church, head of the head of the, the wife as the Christ is the head of the church, and so listen to me. Here's what I'm saying. Here's my pronouncement. Husband who does that is going to ruin his marriage. But a husband who helps his wife and says, "Hey, dear, uh, you know, I studied this. What did you study today?" I was studying this book. What, what, tell me, what, share with me what you were studying. You know, oh, I didn't study today. Well, he all got the point home, didn't he? He didn't even have to tell her. Or the wife who says, honey, I was studying this section, and I came across this, and I really find this interesting in Deuteronomy. Oh, by the way, what book are you reading? Oh, well, I didn't get my study in today. So you can be helpful to each other. But the point being, consider each other. And he says in verse 27 that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not a, not a discouraged church. When you wash it with the word, they come out glorious. They don't come out depressed. Too much hammering to anybody is going to discourage them. You'll have a congregation depressed. I've walked into congregations. They're depressed. When I walk into them, I can tell right away. I can tell right away if those people are skittish. You know, who causes that to be skittish? The way you're treated. The way they're treated. And wives, husbands need to treat you with respect. Husbands need to treat you with consideration. And that's why they need a wife to treat with consideration. 1 Corinthians 7, 14, he talks about the husband who has a wife who's unconverted, he's her ticket to God's kingdom in this life, if he's going to call her. The wife who has a husband who's unconverted, that wife needs to consider him and consider herself his connection with ever being called. What do you know, O oh wife, if you'll sanctify your husband? What do you know, O oh husband, if you'll sanctify your wife? 1 Corinthians 7, 14. Consideration needs to be given to both. Let's go to point number seven. Seventh C, why a husband needs a wife, is to cherish. And I chose that word cherish as opposed to love, which wasn't a C word anyway. But the word cherish, because it cherish means to honor, to love, to hold near, to adore, to protect, to care for lovingly and tenderly, and to treasure. That's why I chose cherish. Husbands need their wives to treasure, to hold near, to adore, and to honor and love, and to protect. Ephesians 5, 25, we're still in Ephesians. Let's go to verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Doesn't say husband, love your wives. That would be plural marriages. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So one strong command, strong role for a husband is to love his wife. He needs a wife to love. 
He needs his wife because he needs someone to love and to cherish and to adore and to respect and to honor. Verse, 20, verse 28 and 29. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. Like you take care of yourself, take care of your wife. Now, if you don't have very good self-esteem, you might not be able to take care of her very well. So you might need some training in that. But verse 29, for no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it even as the Lord, the church. Cherish your wife, nourish, encourage, upbuild, uplift. So that's cherishing your wife. Let me see if I have one more quote here. I do, I'll quote B, if I can find it. Yes. Sarah Ramirez on Brainy Quote said this about love. There's nothing like the first kiss once you've been pronounced husband and wife. It's such a wonderful moment. Something happened from the time the man said, I do, and the, and the dad said, I now, or the, the minister said, I now pronounce you husband and wife. Now they're husband and wife. Before that time, they were fiancés. That first kiss, once they've been pronounced husband and wife, he said, it's so wonderful. And remember what Coach Wooden said about love? Love means many things. It means giving. It means sharing. It means forgiving. It means understanding. It means being patient. It means learning. It means, and you must always consider the other side, the other person. So again, loving. You can, you can give, give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Cherishing. What do you do? How do husbands show? Who do they bring candy home to? Who do they bring a flower home to if they have no wife? Certainly not to themselves. It wouldn't be the same effect. It would not have the same feeling. And by the way, Titus 2 verse 4 tells wives it's okay for them to love their husbands. Our original marriage ceremony done years ago only required the woman to say, do you promise to honor and obey him? and submit to him, as the scriptures say. Never did they promise. I told my wife, you don't have to love me, dear. You just have to submit. <laughs> you never promised to love me. But I found Titus 2.4, and I had a part in doing our current wet wedding ceremony, and I put in love, because I found Titus 2 in verse 4. It says the older women should teach the younger women to love their husbands and love their children. Love. So ladies, it's okay for you to cherish him back. But husbands need a wife for someone to cherish. Number, seven, number eight, another C, is someone to have confidence in. Someone to have confidence in. And I gave the example of John Wooden about how he said the most important thing was what you was having a wife, that one of the most important things you could do is have a wife and how he, he had confidence in her. He said he wanted her with him all the time. The word confidence implies trust. It implies reliance. Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. Why a husband needs a wife? He needs a wife that he can be confident in. Proverbs 31. We'll notice verses 11 and 12. Proverbs 31, verses 11 and 12. The heart of her husband, speaking about the Proverbs 31 woman, this virtuous woman, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. He trusts this. She will do him good and not evil all the days of his life. She will do him good and not evil all the days in his life. Wow. He needs a wife that he could have confidence in. Proverbs 12 and verse 4, another good scripture. Proverbs 12 and verse 4 on this. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. But she that makes ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. A crown. She brings him glory. She makes him feel like a king. She makes him feel like he's worth something. And of course, without that feeling good about who you are, 
Then what happens? A wife who makes, is like rottenness, like cancer in his bones. I'll give you two examples. Uh, Micah 7 and verse 5, I won't, I'll just refer to it, is a negative one where he talks about you can't trust your, those that are closest to you in difficult times. He said, and don't open up to or don't give counsel to the person, the woman who lies in your bosom. Don't disclose to her. Micah 7 verse 5 is negative. And also Samson and Delilah, that's found in, if you want to check it out later, Judges 16 verses 15 to 18. Judges 16 verses 15 to 18. Samson fell in love with Delilah. She was told by the Philistines, see if you can find out what the source of his strength is. So she would entice him and into bed with her and all the rest. And she, and he, well, tell me, where do you get your strength? And he said, well, you know, if you have seven thongs, like re, that have not been dried, they're kind of still new. If I'm tied with those, I can't do anything. So she tied him up with those. And then she would say, the Philistines are here. <laughs> he, chopped, he broke them. Oh, Samson, you lied to me. You didn't treat me nice. Then he said, she said, tell me what it is. He said, OK, new ropes that have never been used on anybody else. New ropes. That'll do it. You time by me. So she bound, bound his hands with new ropes. She said, the Philistines are here. And he jumps up and snaps the ropes. Oh, Samson, you didn't confide in me. You didn't, you treat me so badly. You lied to me. He said, okay. She's telling me what it is. Okay, if you braid my hair, my hair in seven braids and put a pin back there to hold it, put a bobby pin or a Samson pin back there to hold it, uh, I, I'll lose my strength. So she did that, and then she yelled again. Uh, the Philistines are here. Of course, he jumped up. The Philistines were waiting out. They could see he wasn't at all going to be able to be subdued. So she said, oh, you treated me so badly. Why can't you confide in me? She wanted him to confide in her. Husbands need a wife to confide in, but not about your strength, not about losing your hair, your, your, what's happening. So in verse 15, she said, how can you say you love me when you won't confide in me? And then he told her, if my hair is cut, I'll lose my strength. I'm a Nazarite. So she had him put her head on her lap, and he soothed him, rubbed him, probably massaged him, and he was asleep, and she cut his hair. Then she said, the Philistines are here. And he got up, and he had no strength. And then they put his eyes out right away, and you know the rest of the story. But you need a wife to confide in. He, she said, how can you say you love me when you won't confide in me? Marriage, husbands need wives in order to confide in, to have confidence, to share things with. Very important. And finally, point number nine, the ninth C, is to have a, someone you can cleave to. Cleave to. Genesis 22, Genesis 2, verse 21. Genesis 2, verse 21. The word cleave, I looked it up years ago, and it means stick like glue. Stick like glue. <laughs> So he wants to be glued to somebody. He might as well be glued to his wife. He should be glued to his wife. Genesis 2, verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of the ribs, and he closed up the flesh thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. He built a woman from that rib, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now, probably with a gleam in his eye, that said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman out of man, Isha, for she was taken out of man. She'll be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Therefore, they were both naked, the man and the, his wife, and they were not ashamed. Why should they be ashamed? They were married. Why should they be ashamed? There were no other human beings around. 
The animals, they didn't mind because the nano animals were running around naked, so they didn't mind. <laughs> they didn't mind what's happening. But the point being, they need to cleave to each other. A husband needs a wife, someone who will be faithful to him. He needs a wife who will be committed to him. Both of, the, both of those definitions are found in that area. <clears throat> and in Malachi 2, verse 14, I, I read it before. He says, this is the woman that you have covenanted with. You've made a deal with. You've agreed with. You stick with her. Don't divorce. God says he hates divorce. Covenant with her. Malachi 2.14 tells us that. And in Matthew 19, verses 9 and 10, this is my last scripture. Matthew 19, verses 9 and 10, we find Jesus Christ's teaching again on this. And this is repeated several times, by the way, about husbands cleaving to their wives. If they're going to be glued to somebody, they're best to be glued to their wife. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, the wife is like a leech stuck to his skin. He can't go anywhere where she is. He can't make anywhere where she is. He can't say anything where she is. She's always grabbing his arm, you know, holding on to him. As I recall, one Sabbath service in Pasadena, California, we were sitting a little bit farther back in this newly married older couple. This woman was all over this man for the whole church service. The poor guy couldn't even turn in his scriptures. Couldn't even turn to them because she was all over holding on. And, and that's I call Ivy growing on him. <laughs> it's Ivy. Okay. Her name wasn't Ivy, but it was like <laughs> Ivy growing, Ivy growing all over him. That does, doesn't mean that. It means you stay with each other. We're sticking together. We're committed to each other. We're not leaving you. I'm not start leaving you. I'm not saying, first time we have a problem, oh, I'm sleeping on the couch. Oh, here, take your ring back, Whoosh, throw it across the room. That's no way to make a marriage work. Everybody has problems and difficulties in marriage. No marriage is perfect, except the heavenly twins who just rock back and forth. They have, neither one has any gumption. Neither one has any fight in them. And they just rock on, nice day, Martha, nice day, Clem, nice day, Martha, nice day, Clem. Looks like it's going to rain. Yes, Clem, looks like it's going to rain. Yeah, yeah, they're 2%, apparently, are heavenly twins. But 98% still have difficulties getting along. And so you've got to cleave. You've got to stick it out. And I've known of couples who, if they just stuck it out a little longer, they would have made it over the hump. But they couldn't handle the hump, so they divorced. And by the way, the second person usually is not going to be much better. In fact, maybe even worse. But divorce hurts so much, you may end up sticking with him rather than the first one. Very sad. So again, someone to cleave to. Matthew 19, verses 9 and 10, he said, I say to you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, shall marry another, commits adultery, and whosoever... Whoso marries her which is put away commits, does commit adultery. Verse 10, his disciples say to him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it's good not to marry. If you've got to be faithful, if you've got to stick like glue to this person, maybe it's better not to marry. And if you have that thought, maybe you shouldn't get married. Maybe you shouldn't get married. Marriage is not until divorce do you part. Marriages until death do you part. And sadly enough, some people have had the divorce because of the way they were treated, because of the way the relationship went, because of sexual immorality, and that's sad. But marriages until death do you part, not until divorce do you part. So again, someone to cleave to, someone to hold on to. Again, John Wooden had his wife. He wrote her a letter every day, 25 years years, every month, 25 years. But I must have had a big stack under that pillow, 12 times 25, over 250, probably close to like 280 or 270. That's a lot of letters because he loved his wife. He cleaved to her. Husbands need their wives to cleave to. So in conclusion, husbands do need their wives. They need their wives to compliment and compliment. They need their wives to conduct. They need their wives to communicate with, and they need their wives to be a companion to.
They need their wives to co-parent with, and they need their wives to consider. They need their wives to cherish. They need their wives to have confidence in. They need their wives to cleave to. May husbands and wives and future husbands and wives learn to need and appreciate each other that they may live happily together for the rest of their lives.